Ephesians chapter 1. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Well, good morning. Um, really good to be able to share together um, from God's word. Now, we've been working through uh, for the last few weeks this book by Alistair Begg. And um, so I just want to kind of quickly skim through what we've been doing. Um, if you've not um, got this book, it doesn't matter too much, but it is a really good book. Um, and as David was uh, mentioning, it basically, um, the author, who's a pastor from, well, he's originally from Scotland, but uh, uh, in the States, in Ohio, um, he um, really encourages people uh, who are listening to his sermons, but also reading the book, to have a passion to pray better. And so that's what this book, Pray Big, is about. It's that we might model our prayers on the prayers of Paul, the Apostle Paul, particularly from two prayers in Ephesians, and that we might um, be encouraged to pray better ourselves. Now, in the introduction, um, he dealt with who do we pray to, and, um, and then how should we pray. So in that first introduction, we realized that we come to God as our Heavenly Father, God as our dad, an intimate opportunity to, to come to God and talk to God as our dad. Um, but then how should we come? Well, we were challenged that though we can come and speak to God as a, our father God who is in heaven, um, he is a God who is God beyond us, almighty and in heaven. And therefore we should come to him humbly and recognizing as David has encouraged us to do that great difference there is between God's amazing perfection and our poverty. Um, and so we were encouraged on to come to God, but recognize that he is awesome, almighty God. And then in the first chapter, we were encouraged to uh, know what to pray, what to pray. And the, the what we were told should be that we should pray with heaven's priorities. So many of our prayers um, for, for us and for me, as I was being challenged by this book, are about, you know, my family, about my needs for work, about my, um, you know, about my own health, about other people's health in the church. I'm, I'm praying for those things. And, and those are right things to pray for, but they're not actually what um, so many of the prayers in the New Testament, and particularly these prayers of the Apostle Paul, are about. They are about heaven's priorities. And so the challenge in that first chapter was we should be coming to our Heavenly Father humbly, but coming wanting God's priorities to be the things that we pray about. Well, that was the, the kind of the key for the, that first little bit. But then what um, we've been looking in these last few weeks, and we've got one more week at least in this, is these three verses, well, roughly three verses from verses 18 through to 20 in Ephesians and chapter 1. Um, so if you don't have it there, I'm going to hopefully get this up. Thank you very much. That's, that will help me. Um, and so this is actually from the ESV version, the English Standard Version, 
version, the anglicized version, um, so that um, you will be able to see what we've been looking at over these last few weeks and what's coming up next. So um, Paul the Apostle prays this. He says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know three things you see it could have been my sermon couldn't it but um, I'm afraid we've had to take each of these but the three things are what is the hope what are the riches and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power so spoiler alert next week's is going to be that immeasurable greatness of his power this week's is what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints last week's or those of you that remember, was what is the hope to which he has called us? Do you remember um, that? And then the previous time when David preached was the eyes of your heart be enlightened that you may know. So that, that was the title of the chapter for David's um, sermon was Focus. That wasn't David's title, but it's a chapter in, in this book here. And it was that God would give wisdom and understanding that our hearts will be increasingly open to know the spiritual things. That's having the eyes of our heart enlightened that we might know. Know not just in your head, but in your heart. Know with both intellect, thinking, but also intimacy with emotional feeling. Know God and know what's important to him. And then these three what's. Last week was the what that the apostle uh, Paul wanted the Ephesians to really know in their head and in their hearts. He wanted them to know the hope of their calling and our calling as believers, that they were, as Phil was telling us last week, that they were secured as an anchor, held tight, um, tied by Jesus and held tight by God the Father. That was a, an amazing picture, wasn't it, of how we have a hope, not a flimsy, I wish for something, but a certainty. And that's the difference between Christian hope and the Christian hope that the Apostle Paul was praying for and then, uh, and the world's hope. And then this week, we're going to be looking at the riches of our inheritance as believers. And next week, spoiler alert, the power available to us as believers. Well, let's, let's pray as we come to this passage. Father God, we do indeed come humbly before you, almighty creator, sustainer of the universe, sustainer of the air which we breathe, the one who loved us before the foundation of the world, who, who set his Would you encourage us with it? Would you challenge us to pray better because of what we know? And Holy Spirit, would you help, un help us understand better from your word this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as I was growing up as a teenager, I had an uncle, okay? Many of you may have uncles and aunts. My uncle was a bit, um, well, he was a bit of a strange uncle. He lived um, in uh, uh, this cottage on the side of a loch in Scotland, literally. And it was a kind of old farm cottage. And he was actually, his name was Mungo Manderson. For, for if you, okay, yes, I have an uncle called Mungo. Um, so my uncle Mungo, and he was, he was actually an antiques dealer. And he had these amazing um, barns or outhouses in this, um, this old farm on the side of the loch that he lived on. And uh, in this barn were like the most amazing load of rubbish that you have ever seen. You know, it was just piled up. But, but you've got to remember that, that he was an antiques dealer. And so he thought in his head that these things that he had were really valuable. And there were some amazing things there. And as a teenage boy growing up, it was fascinating to see some of those things. And, and the one that I really, really loved and wanted if I was going to inherit anything from my uncle Mungo was this beautiful, didn't work, clapped out 
old MGA. For those of you out there, it was a beautiful MGA. The bodywork, not great, but it was, it could have been restored. It was absolutely beautiful. And as a teenage boy, this was just, oh, I would love that. Um, and there were some other things that, that looked kind of reasonable. They were, you know, a bit tatty and but the, the kind of running joke in the family and the running joke for, for me and my, my little brother was that, that my uncle would always come and tell us and he would show us things and he would go, look at this, this is amazing. And it would be some kind of heap of junk kind of thing to me in my, my eye. And he said, look, I only paid maybe a hundred pounds for it, but it's worth, it's worth thousands. It's worth thousands of pounds. And it's just incredible that I I've got it here in my barn and it's worth so much money. And the, the running joke was that we would always say that and we'd go, yeah, you know, once we were in the car on the way home, we'd go, yes, you know what? It was worth 65,000 pounds. And that's how you would talk, you see. And so we'd always say, you know, I bought it for a few hundred pounds and it's worth 65,000 pounds. Can you believe it? Um, and anyway, that was what my uncle was like. So he was a bit sort of um, out there, but, when sadly my uncle died a few years ago, actually there was something that I did inherit. Now I, I kind of did have to pay partly for it because um, in order to help support his, his uh, wife, my aunt, um, we needed to be able to help support her. And so I bought this thing because it reminds me of my uncle Mungo. It is my inheritance from uncle Mungo. And those of you who know me know that I do like a bike, okay? So, okay. So for those of you who don't know what this is, this is a Brompton. It's actually a 1985 Brompton, okay? Very old Brompton, but it basically is the same design now. It is a beautiful design, I'll, I'll go on about that, but it is a great, great bike. And this is my inheritance. Now, this inheritance, it was probably paid for a few hundred pounds, maybe a hundred pound or so. And it's worth, no, it's not worth 65,000 pounds, but it is worth a reasonable amount of money, even in today's money. And it is, uh, it is my inheritance. And I, I remember my Uncle Mungo, very fondly actually, um, through this bike every time I have it out and ride it. So it's very precious. But you, brothers and sisters, you, do you know what? You have something better, more valuable, more amazing, and uh, far richer than even a 1985 model Brompton. Okay. And I want to tell you a little bit about that. It's our amazing inheritance in God. And do you know what? It's worth more than 65,000 pounds. It's actually worth more than the most perfect jewel. It's worth more than the most precious metal. So the title for today's message is this, he says. Hopefully the clicker didn't work again, but... But... Yes, I might need you to... Uh, Oh, it's working. Okay, so invest in your rich inheritance. Invest in your rich inheritance. So what is the rich inheritance that we as believers are to know both in our heads and in our hearts from this passage? Well, it's the glorious riches of God in all his glory. The glorious riches of God in all his glory. In verse 17 um, of Ephesians 1, it describes God uh, as God, the father of all glory. God, the father of all glory. But what is the glory of God and why is it such a rich value? Well, the glory of God is the outshining of all of God's character. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16, Timothy describe, uh, Paul describes to Timothy that God is a God who lives in unapproachable light. And this is his glory. It's the outshining of his pure holiness. It's the outshining of his perfect love. It's the outshining of his dazzling power. It's the outshining of his infinite wisdom. And so I could go on. The people of Israel called it God's Shekinah glory. And it was this outshining that Jesus' transfiguration that showed Jesus 
was God. It showed Jesus in all God's glory. And that was what shone out of Jesus in a Mount of Transfiguration. And John, who was a witness of that transfiguration, describes Jesus in John and chapter 1 and verse 14 as, he describes him as the one who bore the glory of the one and only. The one who bore the glory of the one and only. So this is the amazing truth that Paul wants the Ephesian believers to know personally and experientially that they and we are to inherit, not a Brompton, they and we are to inherit God himself. And we get to be with him and experience all of his pure and perfect glory in heaven forever. And because God is unchanging, his glory never never fades. And so our inheritance, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, it will never perish, spoil, or fade. So that's our rich inheritance. But the saints, the believers made holy by faith in Jesus, do not just have a rich inheritance in God, <coughs> Here is the second amazing thing. They are also that rich inheritance themselves. You see, the eternal covenant, and that was one of the things that Don taught us about. Do you remember the eternal covenant is that agreement that God the Father made with God the Son before time? And in that eternal covenant, God the Father agreed exactly who would be the inheritors of the blessings of Jesus's obedience. Those would be God's chosen people. And who are those chosen people? Well, they are the ones who God had called, who are chosen and promised before time. So if you still got Ephesians 1 open there in front of you, look at the beginning of Ephesians in chapter 1. In the first few verses, um, so let's just read from verse 4 through to verse 6. It says this, For he, God chose, God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. So all of those who are foreknown and predestined and called will be justified and glorified, as Paul puts it in that passage in Romans and chapter 8, verses 29 to 30, that great chain of redemption. So God has promised, God the Father has promised the Son that there will be those who are chosen as the rich inheritance that Christ Jesus, the Son, will inherit. And you and I, as believers in Jesus, are part of that rich inheritance we are those who have been chosen or are elect, given by God the Father to the Son. And why? Well, John chapter 17, Jesus prays to the Father and he says that they, you and I, and the believers, those early apostles, might see the Father's glory and know the glory of the Son. That is what we will inherit. And what Christ will inherit is us, those who share in his glory. So not only is God our rich inheritance as believers, and we are Christ's rich inheritance as part of this eternal covenant, but perhaps most strangely, here is something else. You are my rich inheritance you are my rich inheritance. You see, as God lives in each believer, 
by his Holy Spirit, God's glory is displayed through each of you and me. Through each of us, albeit imperfectly, we display to each other and to all the spiritual realms out there, God's glory. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. It says that in, in verse 14 in Ephesians chapter 1. Let me just flick that back. It says, um, the Holy Spirit, who is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So the Holy Spirit is our guarantee, but he's also the one who brings about the metamorphosis, the change, the change, as it were, from us being sort of spiritual caterpillars to spiritual butterflies, changing us into the likeness of Jesus with ever increasing rich glory. So let me read to you this passage from 2 Corinthians and chapter 3 of the Holy Spirit's work. So this is 2 Corinthians 3 and verses 18. It says this, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So God is our rich inheritance, shown in his glory. We are Christ's rich inheritance, those who Christ has glorified. And you are my rich inheritance as we are being changed into ever, those who are in ever-increasing glory of the Lord. But practically, Come on, Ken, this book is supposed to be helping me to pray, you might say. So how is this going to help me to pray? Well, these three amazing truths should help us to pray better. Let me show you how. Well, in Christ, we are rich and will be rich beyond our wildest imaginations in the most valuable and dependable commodity of all, not in gold, but in the glory of God. And this is truly something worth investing in. We need to be those who invest in this most valuable and most dependable commodity. The psalmist says in Psalm 66 verses 1 and 2, shout for joy to God all the earth, sing the glory of his name, make his praise glorious. You see, knowledge of God intimately and intellectually is the fuel of the Christian faith. It drives us, it keeps us going. Knowing the glorious truth of God's omnipresence teaches us that we will never be alone. Do you remember, Don taught us that. Knowing the truth of his unchanging, of God's unchanging immutability, that's what the word means, gives us solid security. Knowing the truth of God's faithfulness gives us certainty that we can trust in. Knowing the truth of God's unbounded, you can't measure it, love, his, gives us value and worth as his chosen and adopted children. Knowledge of this rich, rich inheritance will change how we live and how we worship, because that's what our lives are. They're to be a reflection, a thank you, a worship to God. And so if we know this is who God is, then that will change how I live, how I live in my family, how I live in my job, and it will change in my thankful heart, how I want to say, God, you are worth worshipping. So, yes, this is amazing. However, if as believers, we are also Christ's rich inheritance, then this fact holds true. The greater the crowd, the greater the glory. The more rescued, 
the greater the glory for the rescuer. You see, Christ is glorified by a handful of faithful believers, much like we are this morning. But how much more praise and glory does he get from a great crowd of witnesses? Romans 10 and verse 14 says, how can they who don't know him, how can they call on one who have, they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone telling it to them? And how and can someone go and tell them unless they are sent? The knowledge of Christ's rich inheritance should spur you and me on to tell those who don't know about Jesus, our rescuer, to invest in this growing value of his glory. Yes, the more that others know him, the more they will reflect his glory as he changes them from sinners to those who know him, who are saints, holy ones. And what about the knowledge that you are my inheritance and that I am your inheritance? Yes, well, we should be praying passionately for each other that we would show ever-increasing likeness to God's glory. This is one of the gifts that God has given us whilst we're here in this dark world. He has given us each other. Now, you may or may not be a fan of Lord of the Rings by J.R. Tolkien, but in that uh, story, there is a, a hobbit called Bilbo Baggins. Now, he's the unlikely hero and he gets this strange gift on his uh, long journey. Um, and one of these strange gifts is that he has this bottled gift of bottled starlight that he might have light in the darkest of times. Those who know the, the movie will know the, um, the picture, yeah? He gets given this bottle of starlight that he might have light in the darkest of times. Well, the Apostle Paul says this in Ephesians 2.15. He says that we as believers are to shine as stars in the universe as we hold out the word of life to others and to each other. You see, in the darkest times, not only may we know the presence of Father God through the Holy Spirit, but may we have the bright light of a brother or sister. And the more we pray for them, for you and for me, the more we pray for them, the brighter they will be for us in that dark time. And all the glory will go to God. So let us invest in our inheritance. Let us pray that you and I may know God and his glory, not just know it up here, but know it in here, and that you and I would be bold to share Christ, that he might be glorified by more who don't yet know him, and pray for ever-increasing glory to be displayed in each other. That's what we long for, isn't it? Amen. We're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision, but